It's no secret that one of the best ways to become a better fiction writer is to read lots of fiction, but it goes beyond that. To become a better writer, you can't just read a lot. You have to learn and practice how to read books as a writer, not as a reader. And those two skills are definitely not the same. Coming up, my five top tips on how to read fiction like a writer, which will in turn make you a better writer. Coming up. Hello, writer friends. I'm Jessica Brody, author of Save the Cat Writes a Novel and the founder of the Writing Mastery Academy, where you can get access to all my online writing courses for less than the cost of a membership to the Cheese of the Month Club. Much less. Those things are actually really expensive. In this video, we're talking about reading, but not just reading like a reader, reading like a writer. And believe it or not, those are not the same thing. Reading lots of fiction can make you a better fiction writer. But if you use these five tips on how to read like a writer, you'll be able to get so much more value and wisdom out of your precious reading time and fast track your progress toward your writing goals. Before we get into the tips, let's first talk about the key differences between reading like a reader and reading like a writer and the ideal mindset to be in when you do the latter. When you read fiction as a reader, you're usually seeking an enjoyable experience. Entertainment. You're trying to guess what comes next, living on the edge of your seat, feeling thrilled by the twists you didn't see coming, or maybe even frustrated that you didn't see them coming. However, when you read fiction like a writer, it's essentially not about entertaining yourself, it's about educating yourself. It's about trying to figure out what the writer did, and most important, why? Why did the writer put this scene here? How does this character reaction service the entire character arc? What does this piece of world building do to immerse the reader? What purpose does this scene serve to the entire plot? These are the kinds of questions you should be asking yourself as you read fiction as a writer. It doesn't mean you can't read fiction as a reader anymore. It just means that when you sit down to study a novel for the purposes of learning from it and honing your own craft, you're going to be approaching the process differently. You'll be wearing a different hat. So let's put on our writer hats and get studying. Tip one, read the novel as a reader first. Yes, I'm sorry to say, to read a book effectively as a writer, you have to read it twice. First as a reader, then as a writer. The books I analyze and break down as examples in Save the Cat Writes a Novel and my online Save the Cat course are all books I've read at least twice. It's nearly impossible to identify all the intricate details of what the writer has done if you don't know the ending of the book and where the characters are heading. So the first step is always to read the book first. But this is when you get to read it as a reader, for entertainment. So enjoy yourself. Let yourself be surprised, shocked, thrilled, lulled into a false sense of security only to have the rug ripped out from under you. Then once you have the full picture of the story in your mind, turn back to page one and start again. Tip two. Try to identify the beats, at least the five foundation beats. Once you have the full picture of the story in your head, on the second read, you can start to look for things and how they fit together. You can start to identify the structure of the story. If you follow the Save the Cat method, this could mean creating a beat sheet for the book. It doesn't have to be a fully fleshed out, polished beat sheet like the ones I include in Save the Cat Writes a Novel or my Save the Cat online novel writing course, since it's only for you. You can just do more of an outline writing bullet points for each beat. Or if the idea of finding and identifying all 15 beats overwhelms you, just identify the foundation beats. Catalyst, break into two, midpoint, all is lost, and break into three. Because the foundation beats are the single scene beats and the turning points of the story. They tend to stand out the most when you're reading and are the easiest to find. If you wanna learn more about the five foundation beats, I'll link to a video I've posted in the description below. Crafting a beat sheet will help you identify how the author structured the story and how they used the major turning points to pivot the plot in different directions. As you read and beat, ask yourself things like, how did the catalyst break the status quo? How did the catalyst eventually lead to a break into two decision? How is the act two world different from the act one world? Does the midpoint feel like a false victory or a false defeat? How were the stakes raised at the midpoint? What was lost at the all is lost? Was there a whiff of death and what was it? What plan was created at the break into three? Forcing yourself to identify these things and even write them down will go a long way in helping you understand structure in general. And then you can take those insights and apply them to your own manuscript. Tip number three, 
Identify the before and after character. How does the main character change in the novel you're analyzing? It's helpful to compare a before and after snapshot of the hero. You can do this by simply making a list of the character's problems and flaws, external and internal, that are presented in act one of the story, and then see how each of those things have been improved upon or not by the end of the novel. Like here's one I break down in my complete novel revision course in the lecture about character transformation. This is the character transformation for the hero Eleanor in Eleanor Oliphant is Completely Fine by Gail Honeyman. Warning, small spoilers ahead. At the beginning, Eleanor is lonely, antisocial, has no friends, scarred by the tragedies of her past, and coping with those tragedies through alcohol and a rather delusional fantasy life. By the end, however, Eleanor is seeing a therapist, coping with her past, seeing things as they really are, facing up to what happened to her, and starting a new relationship with a guy at work. These quick snapshots will help you identify and see character transformation on a macro level, which is a lot easier than analyzing it chapter by chapter or even scene by scene. So if you notice the character is plagued by guilt at the start of the novel, jot that down in the before snapshot, and then see if you can identify any change to that problem by the end. Are they still plagued by guilt? Or have they gotten over that? If you want more examples of character transformations from popular novels, check out my complete novel revision course, which I've linked to in the description below. Tip number four, label the backstory. Backstory and flashbacks are one of those storytelling devices that are hard to implement well. We want to dump it in all at once when we really should be more finessed than that. Backstory should be doled out gradually over time in an engaging way, which means revealing it little by little, only giving the reader just enough context to understand and appreciate what's happening to the character in the present, both internally and externally, at that moment of the story, and always leaving them wanting more backstory not less of it. My first indication that an author has implemented backstory well is when I'm itching to read more of it. My first indication that an author has not implemented backstory well is when I'm skimming over long backstory dumps in the story, trying to find my way back to the main story. Once again, a great way to learn how to implement backstory well is to study others who have done it well. At the very least, it's helpful to identify the areas of the story where the writer delivered backstory. This could be a full-on flashback, a memory, or even exposition. When the writer tells the reader something important about the backstory. If you don't mind marking up your physical book, you can use an actual highlighter for this, or just some colorful sticky notes. If you're reading an ebook, the highlight feature is built in. Take note of how the backstory is weaved in, how the writer transitions in and out of it, how sporadic or non-sporadic it is, and also what the writer is withholding, making you desperate to learn more about. If you want to take your back study story a step further, you can even create a spreadsheet. Bear with me here for a moment. Build a spreadsheet in Excel, Google Sheets, Numbers, or any other app. Label each row as a chapter in the book and record what you learned about the character's backstory, if anything, in that chapter. And maybe even your analysis of why this piece of information was revealed here. If the book has multiple main characters or points of view, you can use the columns to keep track of each character. If this sounds like a lot of work, it is but it's a lot of illuminating work that will help you start to see patterns in what makes for effective backstory. And finally, tip number five, identify the goals of key scenes. All stories should have goals, and many writing teachers, myself included, will also insist that every scene should have a goal, even if it's as small as getting a cup of coffee, or sending an email, or finding a book at the library. A scene goal helps the reader understand why this scene is in the story and how it serves the plot. If the reader can't understand that, even on a subconscious level, the story will feel like it's dragging in that moment because the scene lacks purpose and connection. So here's a challenge. Go through the book you're analyzing scene by scene, or chapter by chapter, and start identifying the goals of each scene, or at least each key scene, like the major scenes where the big plot points happen. You can even add this to your spreadsheet if you want. Once you identify scene level goals, you'll start to see how they connect and form the larger story level goals. Storytelling is all a big web of goals, and when you write them all out, your eyes will be opened to how these goals feel like links in a chain. And if you want to take it a step further, you can also identify the conflict of each scene. Like scene level goals, scene level conflict doesn't have to be big. It just has to be big enough to make the scene level goal feel difficult. Like a long line at the coffee shop where the character is trying to get that cup of coffee. A temporary Wi-Fi outage preventing the character from sending the email. The book the character is looking for at the library is already checked out and so on. Add these scene level conflicts to your analysis, 
or your spreadsheet and watch how the story unlocks. The curtain is pulled back and the magic is revealed. If you want to dive deeper into scene level goals and conflict and backstory and character transformation and structure, check out my complete novel revision course streaming on demand now in the Writing Mastery Academy. Once again, I'll include a link to that in the description below. So those are my five tips for how to read fiction like a writer. I will warn you, however, once you pull back that curtain and start taking a look at how it all works, it might be difficult for you to read like a writer in the future. You'll start seeing these same patterns in books you're not trying to analyze. It won't ruin books for you forever, it'll simply change the way you experience them. But in the end, it'll make you a better writer. So hopefully it'll all be worth it. Thanks so much for watching, friends. If you'd like to see more writing videos from me, be sure to hit that like button and the subscribe button while you're at it. I will see you next time. And until then, happy writing and happy reading.